Gorgons and hydras and chimeras, dire stories of Ceylano and the harpies, may reproduce themselves in the brain of superstition. But they were there before. They are transcripts, types. The archetypes are in us. And eternal, how else should the recital of which we know, in a waking sense to be false, come to affect us at all? Is it that we naturally conceive terror from such objects, considered in their capacity of being able to inflict upon us bodily injury? Oh, least of all, these terrors are of older standing. They date beyond body, or without body, they would have been the same. That the kind of fear here treated is purely spiritual, that is strong in proportion as it is objectless on earth. That it predominates in the period of our sinless infancy, our difficulties, the solution of which might afford some probable insight into our anti-mundane condition, and a peep, at least, into the shadow land of pre-existence. Charles Lamb, witches and other night figures. This collection is to be compiled on behalf of the Library of Miskatonic University of Arkham to further enhance the collective understanding of the incident known as the Dunwich Horror of 1928. Within, I, head librarian Dr. Henrietta Armitage, have collated related recordings and my own personal retellings as far as my human perception can allow related to the titular event. I forewarn those listening to this archive. This collection deals with elements and entities forbidden to this world. If you have not received direct verbal and written consent to access this collection from the president of Miskatonic University, you are to immediately cease listening and return this collection to its proper catalog at once. You have been warned. Trusting you were granted the proper clearance, I now first present a recorded military correspondence by United States Army Officer Charles Baxter and Army Physician Alexander Hall, who investigated the Watley Farm Estate on behalf of the United States government following the draft investigation of 1917. Date, September 3rd. Lieutenant Charles Baxter, accompanied by physician Alexandra Hall. This record entails the results of our investigation into the Dunwich region of North Central Massachusetts, and, as specifically directed, the Waitley Farm Estate, upon the order of Squire Sawyer Waitley, chairman of the Regional Draft Board. Our focus was to ascertain the accuracy of information published in the Boston Globe and Arkham Advertiser following the procedural draft investigation of Dunwich. This is our findings. Firstly, 
I feel it would be pertinent to discuss the Dunwich region as a whole, providing context to this report, as the queer culture of the area undoubtedly plays a role in these strange happenings. Customarily, we begin at the dilapidated hamlet known as Dunwich Village, hugging the vertical slope of Round Mountain. Upon entering the village, the squalor was apparent in the many deserted homes falling into ruin. The broken steeple church stood as the only mercantile establishment in the place, and thus served as the best starting point possible in this backwater county. Interviewing the natives proved difficult, to say the least. A very standoffish one. Standoffish? One of them swung from my nose! Then press assault charges and see how that goes. From what I could understand, their accents making my work no simple task, the Waitleys have garnered themselves a reputation for the wicked and the occult amongst the locals. Not to mention the unexplainable, violent death of Mrs. Waitley in 1890 had not helped make the place very popular. Their homestead resides in the prominent Sentinel Hill, one of the largest mounds in the landscape, topped with a tall stone circle and a stone altar to the boot. Likely an Indian sacrificial mount, if you ask me. There, throughout the last four years, witnesses attest to seeing the Waitleys performing rituals of sort. Large fires shooting from the hilltop and earth rumbling yearly, on May Eve and Halloween, respectively. I doubted the validity of these statements rightly, but multiple locals were extremely serious in their descriptions. These superstitions run deep in their blood, I think. Following these strange interactions, we ventured into the countryside to approach the Waitley Farm estate for ourselves. I must say, despite the undeniable beauty of the landscape, there is an aura that chilled myself to the bone. Almost A at- likely placebo from the ghost stories the natives are so fond of. We arrived at the Waitley property, four miles from the village and a mile and a half from any other dwelling. The estate consisted of a large main home, a livestock barn, and a few miscellaneous tool sheds. The architecture that matched matched that of the decaying village, reminiscent of a bygone era. I noted that a section of the home's ground floor visibly displayed signs of a recent reclamation, but strangely had its windows tightly boarded up. Keep in mind, the man installed a solid plank door into one of his second-story windows and built a wooden runway spanning from it to the ground near the cattle. Yes, the housing setup was strange and reclusive. We knocked on the door and were greeted by a middle-aged albino woman. Our presence seemingly alarmed her. We asked for the other members of the household to come inside and speak with us for a time. She closed and latched the door, and we waited. As we stood there, I could hear from within the house a stomping of sorts. It came from the second floor. It sounded like a horse had gotten loose right there in the house. After some hollering, the stomping settled. Soon, after the entire family came out to join us... I'll take the lead on this part. Go right ahead. Skipping the pointless imagery, the family's composition was as followed. Old Waitley, a man of the age of gray hair, and slowly failing health, I concur. Lavinia Waitley, an albino woman in her late thirties, the daughter of Old Waitley, and Wilbur Waitley, the strangest specimen of them all, the son of Lavinia. My chief concern was the boy and his development in this case. Old Waitley spoke on behalf of the group. Despite being as obfuscating as the other locals, he was willing to cooperate with my inquiry. The boy, Wilbur Waitley, was born at 5 a.m., on Sunday, the 2nd of February, 1913. The natives said that night the hill sounds were the loudest they've been. A hideous screech tore out across the valley, and the dogs barked till daybreak. It's supposedly speaking, no record exists as no doctor or midwife was present at his birth. Lavinia has no known husband, and as custom for the region, didn't disavow the child. Speculate what you will. At three months, Wilbert had attained a size and muscularity, not usually found in infants under one year old. By seven months, he was able to walk unassisted. At 11 months, the boy could talk, apparently free of infantile lisp. 
and lacking the accent customary to the region. By a year and seven months, Wilbert was the size of a child of four years and was a surprisingly fluent and intelligent speaker. And at age four, his current age, he looked to me the size of a boy at 10 years of age. He was unnatural. The boy's features were uncommonly goatish or animalistic in appearance. He had thicker lips. His facial pores were larger and rougher in size. All unclothed skin had a yellowish ting. His hair was coarse and crinkly, and Wilbur had oddly elongated ears, um, among other things. The child pulled a goddamn pistol on you. All right, I'll save the rest for the written report. To elaborate on my colleague's outburst, I inquired the boy to begin removing his clothing to complete the inspection of his health. The family looked uneasy, and the boy stepped back, afraid of me. I repeated the request more forcibly. This was government business, after all. The boy raised his pistol at my forehead as if he had the ability of an average marksman already. Why the hell did a child have a pistol? To fight off the dogs. The dogs abhor Wilbur. They snarl and charge at him, so the boy defends himself at the age of four. Well, truly, Wilbur is a remarkable specimen. He's a monster, goddammit. Charles, please! That child is a danger to Dunwich. He's just a child! You're gonna put a child to the stake for his God-given appearance? Perhaps his growth is a gift from God, and his outward appearance is a miserable coincidence. You don't know that for sure. Science has a reasonable explanation for all phenomena. These tales of demonic witchcraft, of course, are obsolete and ridiculous. Well, I hope your science prevails, Alexandra. Or, God help us all. I apologize for my whimsical companion. I admit, I spoke out of line. Well, that concludes this report. Attached with this recording is written documentation for your perusal. Do with this information what you may. I'm simply glad to leave this godforsaken county. The next voice you will hear is that of Dr. Houghton of Aylesbury, recalling their house call to the Watley farmhouse. This is Dr. Houghton, August 1st, 1924. Due to the peculiar nature of the events I just witnessed, I needed to record my perceptions before my memory fades. Earlier this evening, a wire came in from Osborne's, an establishment within the village of Dunwich. And this was peculiar in and of itself, as I have never received a wire from the region before. On the other end of the line was a man with a deep, rough voice. He sounded urgent and requested I come to his homestead at once. Despite the distance and time of day, I felt compelled by some force to respect the man's wishes. At once, I mounted my Ford and reluctantly drove to the address. Upon reaching the farmhouse, I was greeted by a young, bearded man. He urgently brought me into his home with little acknowledgement, uh, a simple nod, and something said under his breath. I was brought to a bedroom where an old man was resting, and at his side was a young albino woman. I quickly ascertained the old man was in a, a, a very grave state, uh, with a cardiac action and stertorous breathing. I, I told his two family members his end was not far off. The events following roused me in a feeling of dread I have not faced in many years. And at that point, uh, I started to be aware of a rhythmic surging 
or lapping above the house like th like the waves of of some level beach i became more keenly disturbed by the chattering of the night birds outside a seemingly endless legion of whippoorwills had gathered and were singing their message almost diabolically in rhythm with the wheezing, the wheezing gasps of the dying man. It was too uncanny and unnatural. Toward one o'clock, Old Watley regained consciousness and interrupted his wheezing to choke out a few words to his grandson. These words feel carved into my very soul. He said, More space! Will more space soon! You grows and that grows faster! It'll be ready to serve you soon, boy. Open up the gates to Yaxathoth with, with the chance you'll find on page 751 of the complete edition, and then put a match to the prison. Fire from Earth can't burn it, no how. He was obviously quite mad, and the whippoorwills adjusted their tempo, and the strange hill noises gave indications from afar off. He added uh, another sentence or two. <gasps> Feed it regularly, Willie, and mind the quantity but don't let it grow too fast for the place for if it bursts quarters or gets out before you open siagsathoth it's all over and no use only them from beyond can make it multiply and work only them the old ones as wants to come back <sighs> Uh, the man began to gasp once more. Uh, the girl, Lavinia, gave out this torrid scream, and the whippoorwills grew in volume with the old man's wheezing. Uh, this went on for a uh, hellish hour before the final throaty rattle came. Lavinia began to sob as I drew the shrunken lids over the man's glazing gray eyes as the night birds faded imperceptibly into silence. The hill noises kept rumbling. Then I finally got a good look at the man who called me Wilbur. I learned him to be age 10, with the stature and maturity of a full-grown adult uh, three times his age. I can still recall his grotesque, uh, goatish face and beard. In response to his grandfather's passing, Wilbur only said they didn't get him, you know, in, in this heavy bass voice. I'm in a cold sweat now. I must sleep. I'm about to collapse. I'll recollect on tonight's events tomorrow, for now. Whatever force I experienced this night, I hope to never face again in all my waking years.
The next recordings came from the archives of the Arkham Advertiser. I thank them for their cooperation in this matter. The interview you are about to hear is between Dunwich local Earl Sawyer and reporter Jim Pearson at Osborne's General Store. Do we have electricity? I believe so. So we're recording now. It looks like it. Wonderful. Coming to you from Dunwich Village, this is Jim Pearson of the Arkham Advertiser on a special report. Undoubtedly, you are all familiar with our recent stories on the peculiar and occult Watley family. I'm excited to introduce you to Earl Sawyer, a local of the region who reached out to speak specifically about the Watleys. Oh, I have a lot to say about them. Then don't keep us waiting a moment more. Tell me, you've observed some odd home renovations, if I recall our off-air conversation correctly. Wilbur, the son, has just about gutted the place. I suppose, for those who don't know, I should go back a few paces. That would be helpful. Yes. Well, 1923 saw the Wally Elder and grandson start a second great siege of carpentry on the whole estate. I kept my eye on what's happening. It seemed to be all in the upper part, from the bits of discarded lumber. I suspected that the two had knocked out all the partitions and even the attic floor entirely, which would leave only a vast open void between the ground story and the peaked roof. Even taking out the great big chimney, whatever was making the sounds up there was now downstairs with the whole family. Oh, go on. Now this was before old Watley died at 24. After that, the boy, Wilbur, who I dare say resembled a full-grown goat man in appearance by this point. Well, he got real into all these old books. He didn't go out much anymore. People only saw him reading and practicing his rituals on Sentinel Hill, summoning hill noises and great big fires. It was about that time Lavinia disappeared, too, in 26. Lavinia Watley disappeared? Oh, you folks didn't hear about that? Well, according to Mammy Bishop, Wilbur forbid Lavinia from going out. Let me grab my notebook here. Mammy told me that the Vinny came to her, a scared, frail thing. These were the last words she spoke outside that cursed farmhouse. Mammy told me that she said this. There's more about him, as I know, than I can tell you, Mammy, the Vinny said. And nowadays, there's more nor what I know myself. I vow before God, I don't know what he wants, nor what he's trying to do. She's speaking about her son, Wilbur Watley, right? That's correct. The one and the same. I tell you, that Halloween, the hill noises sounded louder than ever, and the fire burned as usual on Sentinel Hill. But I paid more attention to the rhythmical, screaming, vast rocks of birds. All these whippoorwills were drawn to the Watley farmhouse. After midnight, their shrill notes burst into some kind of insane laughter, filling up the whole countryside. Not until dawn did they finally quiet down. Then they vanished, hurrying southward. They were fully a month overdue, might I add. None of the country folks seem to have died, but poor Lavinia Watley was never seen again. Earl Sawyer, I cannot thank you enough for bringing this groundbreaking news to our attention. Oh, that's not all. Recently this summer, Will repaired two of his sheds in the farmyard, moving his books and effects out into them. He was closing all the doors and windows on the ground floor, seemed to be taking out the partitions, just as he and his grandfather had done upstairs four years before. He's now living in one of them sheds. Wilbur is now seven feet tall. Does that seem natural? Furthermore, he seemed unusually worried and tremulous of late. Few folks go by that state now, rightly scared of the tail the, the goatish deformity that is Wilbur Watley. So then, Earl Sawyer, what do you think Wilbur is hiding in that farmhouse? I can't rightly say. It's got to be from that black magic Wilbur and his grandfather practiced, communing with dark powers up on Sentinel Hill. All I can think about is his cow herd. Ever notice how he never has more than 10 or 12 of them out in them fields? Yet he keeps buying more and more each month. Even blacks and infection can't kill a herd that fast. One time, a few men risked taking a close look at the animals. They were these anemic, bugless looking things with odd wounds and sores, almost like incisions peckering their whole body. George even made a complaint, a formal complaint, to the Society of Animal Cruelty about it. But of course, nothing came of it. I don't know what's happening on that farm. I feel it's best to keep an eye on it. I feel it's best to keep an eye on that place. 
but steer clear of it. Last thing I want is anyone else going missing. Stunning, girl. Simply stunning. Thank you for your Despite my best efforts, the recording is unsalvageable past that point. Nonetheless, the next event important to Wilbur's chronology is unrecorded, and is in fact an interaction only I experienced. This is my perspective on the encounter. Wilbur Watley arrived at the library of Miskatonic University during the winter of 1927. A scholar and librarian of the university myself, I was working that fateful day. I was alerted to his presence by the watchdog, who barked and snarled with unnatural fury and enmity. The person, if you could even call him that, who approached my desk stood nigh eight feet tall. His garb consisted of a shabby and dirty ensemble with a cheap valise at his side. He resembled more of a long-bearded, filthy gargoyle than a man. He introduced himself as Wilbur Watley. In a deep bass voice I could scarcely believe could emanate from human organs. Wilbur stated he required access to read the Necronomicon of Abdul Ahazred in Oleus Wormius, Latin version. Miskatonic University kept under lock and key one of the few copies of this tome in the entire world. I inquired further, as access to this book is extremely prohibited due to the dangerously occult nature of the text. He acquiesced to my questioning. Specifically, it seemed he was interested in the 751st page of this book. Wilbur was in search of a particular formula or incantation containing the frightful name Yog sothoth With this information, I assumed he must be a fellow scholar researching the otherworldly much like myself. Even still, I reluctantly gave him access to our Necronomicon. Watching over his shoulder at a library table, I saw he brought an extremely worn copy of Dr. D's English version of the Necronomicon. I knew this text to be a defective recreation of the complete edition we now had on the desk before us. Wilbur began correlating the two texts, and soon found the missing section he was in search of. He immediately began copying the specified excerpt into his notebook. I feel in order to impress upon you the monstrous threats to the peace and sanity of the world that were contained in Wilbur's reading, I must speak aloud, verbatim. The text I involuntarily translated over the man's shoulders. Give me one moment. Here we are. It states as follows. Nor is it to be thought that man is either the oldest or the last of Earth's masters, or that the common bulk of life and substance walks alone. The old ones were, the old ones are, and the old ones shall be. Not in the spaces we know, but in between them. They walk serene and primal, undimensioned, and to us, unseen. Yog sothoth knows the gate. Yog sothoth is the gate. Yog sothoth is the key and guardian of the gate. Past, present, and future all are one in Yog sothoth He knows where the old ones broke through of old and where they shall break through again. He knows where they have trod earth's fields and where they still tread them and why no one can behold them as they tread. By their smell can men sometimes know them near, but of their semblance can no man know, saving only in the features of those they have begotten of mankind. And of those are there many sorts, differing in likeness from man's truest eidolon to that shape without sight or substance which is them. They walk unseen and foul in lonely places where the words have been spoken and the rites howled through their seasons. 
the wind pulses with their voices, and the earth mutters with their consciousness. They end the forest and crush the city, yet may not forest or city behold the hand that smites. Kadath in the cold waste hath known them, and what man knows Kadath? The ice desert of the south and the sunken isles of ocean hold stones whereon their seal is engraven, but who hath seen the deep frozen city or the sealed tower long garlanded with seaweed and barnacles? Great Cthulhu is their cousin, yet can he spy them only dimly. As foulness shall ye know them, their hand is at your throats, yet ye see them not and their habitation is even one with your guarded threshold. Yog sathoth is the key to the gate, whereby spheres meet. Man rules now where they once ruled. They shall soon rule where man rules now. After summer is winter, and after winter, summer, they wait patient and potent, for here shall they reign again. In that moment, associating what I was reading with what I had heard of Dunwich and its brooding presences, and of Wilbur Watley in his dim, hideous aurora stretching from a dubious birth to a cloud of probable matricide, I felt a wave of fright as tangible as a drought of the tomb's cold clamminess. This goatish giant before me now seemed more like the spawn of another planet or dimension only partly of mankind and linked to the black gulfs of essence an entity beyond all sphere of matter space and time this thing could not have this book he attempted to persuade me to allow him to take the book home with him, saying he needed more time to understand and calculate the meanings of the words. <laughs> My expression of firm denial answered that question. Wilbur then asked if he could make a full copy of the specific text. I was half ready to do this for him, but then I remembered the responsibility I held and the potential consequences of allowing this being the key to such blasphemous outer spheres. Finally, Wilbur said, well, all right, if you feel that way about it, maybe Harvard won't be so fussy as you be. And without saying more, he rose and strode out of the building, stooping at each doorway. All at once, I seemed to glimpse some hellish advance in the black dominion of the ancient impassive nightmare that broods through New England's glens and mountaintops. I locked away the Necronomicon, but the room still reeked with unholy and un identifiable stench as foulness shall ye know them during the ensuing weeks I set about collecting all possible data on Wilbur Watley and the formless presence around Dunwich I got into contact with Dr. Houghton of Alsbury examining his experience from the grandfather's death and analyzing his final words quoted by the doctor a close survey of Dunwich Village failed to provide any new information, but an analysis of the Necronomicon and those parts Wilbur searched so avidly provided new, sickening revelations on the strange evil so vaguely threatening to this planet. I sent letters to all the institutions owning a Necronomicon to forbid the demon known as Wilbur Watley from attaining anything more from the tome. That thing would never get the book. time passed, I felt something needed to be done about the luring terrors of the Miskatonic Valley and about the monstrous being known to the human world as Wilbur Watley. It seems that chance encounter was simply a, a taste of Wilbur's exacting determination on this matter. Continuing on, the next recording is that of reporter Jim Pearson of the Arkham Advertiser, who was present outside the library of Miskatonic University on August 3rd. Have you got the recorder going yet? I have no second, sir. Oh, hurry up then. You're ruining the whole story. One second. Uh, we're live. Hello, lady 
ladies and gentlemen, this is Jim Pearson of the Arkham Advertiser coming to you straight from the cobbled streets of Arkham. We received word a short while ago that the burglar alarm at the library of Miskatonic University sounded off late tonight with the entire Arkham police force mobilized to respond. We are currently approaching the crime scene now. It appears a large crowd has formed outside the gates. The police are keeping the concerned citizens away from investigating. I shall now attempt to interview an on-scene witness for your benefit, my dear audience. Ma'am! Ma'am! Do you know who has broken into the library tonight? No. Get that thing out of my face. Well, ma'am, I am in fact Jim Pearson of the office. I don't care who the hell you are. Whoa, folks. I apologize. But it appears a sleep-deprived populace makes for an irritable eyewitness report. Ah! 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 Ladies and gentlemen, I am not entirely sure what we have just witnessed, but, but I... Jim! Jim, look over there! It appears the uh, police are escorting someone garbed in their nightgown through the crowd seemingly heading towards the 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 Joe, Joe, please take the microphone. I, I, I need to sit down. Jim? Jim? Are you okay? The events that directly followed changed my life forever. I warn you once more, what I'm about to place into spoken record is completely truthful and insinuates the terrifying nature of the universe we reside in. Proceed once more with the highest level of caution for your sanity. Awoken by the frenzied noises from the crowd below, I hastened into some clothing and rushed across the street and lawn to the college buildings. I saw that others were ahead of me and heard the echoes of the burglar alarm still shrilling from the library. An open window, shooed black and gaping in the moonlight. What had come had indeed completed its entrance for the barking and the screaming, now fast fading into a mixed low growling and moaning, proceeded unmistakably from within. I instinctively knew that whatever laid inside the library was not for unfortified eyes and directed the officers to prevent anyone from entering the fenced grounds. As I opened the vestibule doors. Uh, my, my two trusted colleagues, Professor Warren Rice and Dr. Francis Morgan, approached me from the lawn. Both scholars to whom I had confided some of my conjectures and misgivings in. I motioned for them to accompany me inside. The inward sounds, except for a, a watchful droning whine from the dog, had by this time quite subsided. But... I now perceived with a sudden start that a loud chorus of whippoorwills among the shrubbery had commenced a, a damnably rhythmical piping, as if in unison with the last breaths of a dying man. The building was full of a frightful stench, which I knew too well. 
and we three rushed across the hall to the small genealogical reading room whence the low whining came. For a second, none of us dared to turn on the light. Then I summoned up my courage and snapped the switch. One of us, I, I truly cannot recall who, shrieked aloud at what sprawled before us. Professor Rice declares that he wholly lost consciousness for an instant, though he did not stumble or fall. The thing that lay half bent on its side in a, in a folded pool of, of greenish yellow ichor and tarry stickiness was almost nine feet tall. And the dog had torn off all clothing and some of the skin. Uh, it was not quite dead, but twitched silently and spasmodically while its chest heaved in monstrous unison with the mad piping of the expectant whippoorwills outside. The thing itself, however, crowded out all other images at the time. It would be trite and not wholly accurate to say that no human pen or voice could describe it, but one may properly say that it could not be vividly visualized by anyone whose ideas of aspect and contour are too closely bound up with the common life forms of this planet. It was partly human, beyond a doubt, very man-like hands and, and head and, and the goatish chinless face had the stamp of the Watleys upon it. But the torso and lower parts of the body were teratologically fabulous so that only generous clothing could ever have enabled it to walk on earth unchallenged or uneradicated. Above the waist, it was semi-anthropomorphic, though its chest had the leathery, reticulated hide of a crocodile or alligator. The back was piebald with yellow and black and dimly suggested the squamous covering of certain snakes. Below the waist, though, it was for the worst, for here, all human resemblance left off and sheer fantasy began. The skin was thickly covered with coarse black fur and from the abdomen a score of long greenish gray tentacles with red sucking mouths protruded limply. Their arrangement was odd and, and seemed to follow the, the symmetries of some cosmic geometry unknown to the earth. On each of the hips, deep set in kind of a pinkish, ciliated orbit was what seemed to be a, a rudimentary eye, whilst in lieu of a tail, there deepened a, a kind of trunk or feeler with purple annular markings and with evidence of being an, an undeveloped mouth or, or throat. The limbs save for their black fur, roughly resembled the hind legs of prehistoric Earth's giant saurians and, and terminated in, in ridgy veins, and terminated in ridgy veined pads that were neither hooves nor, nor claws. When the thing breathed, its tail and tentacles rhythmically changed color as if from some circulatory system normal only to the non-human side of its ancestry. In the tentacles, this was observable as a deepening of the greenish tinge, whilst in the tail it was manifest as a yellowish appearance which alternated with a, a sickly grayish white in the spaces between the purple rings of genuine blood? There was none. Only the folded greenish yellow ichor which trickled along the painted floor and left a curious discoloration behind it. 
Her presence seemed to rouse the dying thing. It began to mumble without turning or raising its head. I, I cannot make a written record of what the thing said, but I assert confidently nothing in English was uttered. At first, the syllables defied all correlation with any speech of earth, but toward the last there came some disjointed fragments, evidently taken from the Necronomicon. That monstrous blasphemy in quest of what... That monstrous blasphemy in quest of which the thing had perished. These fragments, as much as I can recall them, ran something like... Guy... Ga... Ga... Book Shagak Yaha Yog Sathoth Yog Sathoth They trailed off into nothingness as the whippoorwills shrieked in rhythmical crescendos of unholy anticipation. Yet all this was only the prologue to the actual Dunwich horror. Following Wilbur's death, formalities were gone through by bewildered officials. Abnormal details were duly kept from press and public, and men were sent to Dunwich and Aylesbury to look up property and notify any who might be heirs of the late Wilbur Watley. They found the countryside in great agitation, both because of the growing rumblings beneath the domed hills and because of the unwanted stench and the surging, lapping sounds which came increasingly from the great empty shell formed by the Watley's boarded-up farmhouse. The officials devised excuses not to enter the noise and boarded place and were glad to confine their survey of the deceased's living quarters, the newly mended sheds, to a single visit. They filed a ponderous report at the courthouse in Aylesbury, and litigations concerning airship are said to still be in progress amongst the innumerable Watleys, decayed and undecayed, of the upper Miskatonic Valley. An almost interminable manuscript in strange characters, written in a huge ledger and uh, adjudged a sort of diary, became an almost interminable manuscript in strange characters written in a, a huge ledger and adjudged a sort of diary because of the spacing and, and the variations in ink and penmanship presented a baffling puzzle to those who found it. A week later, Wilbur's diary was transported to Miskatonic University to be analyzed. Finally, it was in the dark of September 9th that the horror broke loose. The hill noises had been very pronounced during that evening, and dogs reportedly barked frantically all night. Early risers on the 10th noticed a peculiar stench in the air. I was told that at about 7 o'clock, Luther Brown, the hired boy at George Corey's estate between Coldspur and Glen and the village, rushed frenziedly back from his morning trip to Tenneker Meadow with the crows. As far as I can understand, Luther told Mrs. Corey all he saw that morning, and Mrs. Corey began calling her neighbors to spread that information, thus starting on its rounds the overture of panic that heralded the major terrors. When she got Sally Sawyer on the phone, the housekeeper at Seth Bishop's, uh, the nearest place to the Watleys, it, it became their turn to listen instead of transmit for Sally's boy, Chauncey, who slept poorly, had been up on the hill toward the Watley's estate and had dashed back in terror after one look at the place. Here is what we could recover from that conversation. Yes, Miss Corey, Chauncey has just come back terrified and he couldn't barely talk for being scared. He said, old Watley's house is blown up with the timbers scattered around, almost like there had been dynamite inside. Only the bottom floor isn't through, but it's all covered with a kind of tar-like stuff that smells awful and 
drips down off the edges onto the ground where the, si where the side timbers were blown away. And there's these awful marks in the yard. Two great round marks, bigger than a hog's head, and all sticky with stuff, the same stuff from the blowed up house. Chauncey said they led off into the meadow where a great swath, wider than a barn, is matted down, and all the stone walls are tumbled every which way, wherever it goes. And he told me, Miss Corey, that he thought to look for Seth's cows, frightened as he was, and found them in the upper pasture near the Devil's Hop yard in an awful shape. Half of them were clean gone, and near the other half left is sucked almost dry of blood, with sores on them like there had been on Watney's cattle ever since Lavinia's brat was born. Seth's gone out to look at them now, though. I'll vow he won't care to go very near Wizard Watley's. Chauncey didn't look closely to see where the big mounted down swath led after it went through the pasturage, but he thinks it pointed toward the Glen Road leading to the village. I'll tell you, Miss Corey, there is something abroad as had it ought to be abroad, and I for one think that Wilbur Watley, who came to the bad end he deserved, is at the bottom of the breeding of it. He wasn't all human himself. I always said that to everybody. And I think he and old Watley must have raised something in that nailed up house that is even less human than he was. There's always been unseen things around Dunwich, living things, but things that aren't good for human folks. And Miss Corey, the ground was talking last night. And towards morning, Chauncey said he heard the whippoorwill so loud in Cold Spring Glen that he couldn't sleep. Then he thought he heard another faint-like sound over toward Wizard Watley's, a kind of ripping or tearing of wood, like some big box or crate was being opened far off. What with this and that, he didn't get to sleep at all till sunup. And no sooner was he up this morning that he's got to go over to Watley's and see what's the matter. He's seen enough, Miss Corey. This doesn't mean good. And I think all the folks ought to get up a party and do something. I know something awful's about, though only God knows just what it is. Oh, did your Luther take account of where the big tracks led to? No, he didn't. Luther rushed in and out of the house so fast, I barely had a chance- Well, Miss Corey, if the tracks were on the Glen Road, on this side of the Glen, and haven't got to your house yet, I calculate they must go into the Glen itself. They would do that. I always said Cold Spring Glen wasn't a healthy nor decent place. The whippoorwills and fireflies there never did act like they were creatures of God. And you can hear strange things rushing and talking in the air down there if you stand in the right place between the rock falls and bear's den. That section was all my associates could recover from the Arkham switchboard facility. Now, despite the primitive and decaying nature of the Dunwich region socially and technologically, one young villager apparently had the wherewithal to bring along a portable recording device, understanding the seriousness of the situation. Similar in form and fashion to the device Jim Pearson operated previously in this collection. I believe this meeting of the ragtag Dunwich militia occurred around uh, two days after the previous phone call between Mrs. Corey and Sally Sawyer. During that time, the whole of the region barricaded itself in, too passive to form any kind of organized defense. All right, Earl. You've had nearly three quarters of Dunwich trooping in between Watley Ruins and the Cold Spring Glen. So can you tell me, kid, what in the hell is this thing in front of my face? It's a machine that records sounds and stuff, sir. I got at the pawn shop at Arkham. So... We can play this thing back and hear our voices later? You have it right, Mr. Zebulon. All right. Earl, what does it look like out there? We started at the fishers. Their whole cattle herd was maimed, a few mauled into a fleshy pile. Others had those same puncture wounds and lapless look on them, about the same condition old Watley's herd had been in for years. After that, we went to the Watley's place to see if Chauncey's words held true. The farmhouse looks just how he said it would, as if a bomb had gone off in its depth. The whole thing was blown to pieces with this disgusting black tar covering everything. It doesn't look good. 
The rancid smell was the worst part. None of us dared to get a closer look. Well, then we followed these massive prints, Deb. Wide as a man's height. Whatever had burst loose had gone down to that great sinister ravine. Because all the trees on the banks were bent and broken, and a great avenue had been gouged in the forest straight to Cold Spring Glen. It was as though a house launched by an avalanche had slid down through the tangled growth in an almost vertical slope to get there. We didn't hear anything from the glen, but that same horrible stench was coming from it, clearly. The three dogs we, fought, we brought barked furiously at first, but seemed cowed and reluctant when we got near the glen. We stood at the cliff's edge for a good long while before making our way back. If I had to guess where that thing has made its new home, it's Cold Spring Glen for sure. And that's where we stopped our scouting yesterday. None of us dared to get a closer look. See. Last night, I telephoned the Islesbury transcript so they could warn people to steer clear, but the editor just laughed and said he might put something in the paper. I can't believe he didn't take me seriously. Don't take it personally, Jessica. Outsiders have become accustomed to the wild tales from Dunwich. I wouldn't expect them to understand. Well, here if they sit. Elmer, you said the horror attacked your barn last night. Is that right? That's right. It was about two in the morning. We had the house boarded up and the cattle away in the barn, just like you said to do. And, well, it was two in the morning and our dogs started barking madly. They woke us all up. The next thing I noticed was the frightful stench. It was everywhere. Hold on, Elmer. You live on the eastern edge of Cold Spring Glen, right? Where the thing has been sleeping? That I do. I knew the thing was nearby. We all agreed we could hear some sort of swishing or lapping coming from somewhere outside. My wife wanted to tell us on the neighbors, but before I could agree, the crashing of splintering wood outside stopped me. It was terrifying. Then my poor cattle started screaming that blood-curdling scream of an animal attacked with no way of escaping. The herd stampeded and we all huddled together in the sitting room. I lit a lantern, but I didn't dare step foot outside to see. Thankfully, we were all able to keep quiet. At last, the noise of the cattle subsided to a pitiful moaning, and a great snapping, crashing, and crackling ensued. Amidst the dismal moans from the stable and the demonic piping of the whippoorwills in the glen, Selina tottered to the telephone and, and spread what news she could of the second phase of this horror. It's attacking now, Zeb! Elmer Fry, you are strong, and your family is just as strong being able to survive that. I thank you for telling me this. Of course. We were all panicked hearing this in the morning. I took another group and went to the Fry's place. Two titan swaths of destruction stretched from the glen to the Fry farmyard. The same monstrous prints covered the bare patches of the ground. One side of Elmo's red barn was completely paved in. Of the cattle, only a quarter could be found, and all that survived had to be shot, Zeb. And well, that brings us to now. I appreciate the work you've been putting in. Everyone. Old Watley's black magic has finally brought ruin to Dunwich. What are we going to do? We can't keep hiding in our homes each night praying we're not next. I've been thinking about that very thing, Wheeler. If black magic brought this monster into our world, then it can send it back as well. You better not be serious. That I am. Tradition runs strong in my blood, Earl. I know you don't respect it, but it may be the only option we have. Another Wadley practicing dark rites. That is just what we need right now. <sighs> I'm going to look for my family tomes. There may be some hidden chants that we can perform on Sentinel Hill, just as Wilbur did. I have a list of things I'm gonna need. I don't see why we can't call for help from Alsbury or Arkham. They can give us a fighting chance. I have to agree with the majority, Earl. I think we can hold off on calling them. We can settle this ourselves.
fine. I hope you're right. What's our plan for tonight, then? We do the same. Board up your homes, people. Sleep in a safe place above the ground and keep a rifle on your nightstand. The sun's going down now, so get a move on back to your families. This horror hasn't bested the people of Dunwich yet. Thursday night began much like the others, but it ended less happily. The Whippoorwills in the Glen had screamed with such unusual persistence that many could not sleep, and at about 3 a.m., all the party telephones rang tremulously. Those who took down their receivers heard a fright mad voice shriek out. We were able to recover the short call and the last words of the poor Fry family. <laughs> I was later informed that a hastily assembled group of armed men trudged out to the Fry Place at the head of the glen the next morning. It was horrible, yet hardly a surprise. There were more swaths and monstrous prints, but there was no longer any house. It had caved in like an eggshell, and amongst the ruins nothing living or dead could be discovered, only the stench and tarry stickiness. The Fries had been erased from Dunwich. In the meantime, a quieter yet, even more spiritually poignant phase of the horror had been blackly unwinding itself in Arkham. The curious manuscript record or diary of Wilbur Watley, delivered to Miskatonic University for translation, had caused much worry and bafflement among our experts in languages both ancient and modern, its very alphabet being absolutely unknown to any available authority. The final conclusion of our linguists was that the text represented an artificial alphabet, giving the effect of a, a cipher, though none of the usual methods of cryptographic solution seemed to furnish any clue. Even when applied on the basis of every tongue the writer might conceivably have used, the ancient books taken from old Watley's quarters, while absorbingly interesting, were of no assistance whatsoever in this matter. The strange book was at length given wholly into my charge, because of my particular interest in the Watley matter, and my wide linguistic learning and skill in the mystical formula of antiquity and the Middle Ages. I first had an idea that the alphabet might be something esoterically used by certain forbidden cults which have come down from old times. That question, however, I did not deem vital, since it would be unnecessary to know the origin of the symbols if, as I suspected, they were used as a, as a cipher in a modern language. It was my belief that, considering the great amount of text involved, the writer would scarcely have wished the trouble of using another speech than his own save perhaps in certain special formula and incantations. Accordingly, I attacked the manuscript with the preliminary assumption that the bulk of it was in English. I knew from the repeated failures of my colleagues that the riddle was a deep and complex one, and that no simple mode of solution could merit even a, a trial. All through late August, I fortified myself with the massed lore of cryptography, drawing upon the fullest resources of my library and waiting night after night amidst the arcana of Trothemius Polygraphia, Divinieres Tretisheath, uh, Falconer's Cryptomanesis Patefacta, and such fairly modern authorities as Blair von Martin and Kluber's Cryptographique. The older authorities seemed rather more helpful than the newer ones, and I concluded that the code of the manuscript was one of great antiquity, no doubt handed down through a long line of mystical experimenters. Several times I seemed near daylight, only to be set back by some unforeseen obstacle. Then, 
As September approached, the clouds began to clear. Certain letters, as used in certain parts of the manuscript, emerged definitely and, and unmistakably, and it became obvious that the text was indeed in English. On the evening of September 2nd, the last major barrier gave way, and I read for the first time a continuous passage of Wilbur Watley's annals. It was in truth a diary, as all had thought, and it was couched in a style clearly showing the mixed occult erudition and general illiteracy of the strange being who wrote it. Almost the first long passage that I deciphered, an entry dated November 26th, 1916, proved highly startling and disquieting. It was written, I, I remember, by a child of three and a half who looked like a lad of twelve or, or thirteen. I read as follows. Today, I learned the Akla for the Sabaoth. It ran, which did not like it being answerable from the hill and not from the air, that upstairs is more ahead of me than I thought it would be, and is not like to have much earth brain. Shot Alam Hutchins' collie jack when he went to bite me, and Alam says he would kill me if he dies. I guess he won't. Grandfather kept me saying the dough formula last night, and I think I saw the inner city at the two magnetic poles. I shall go to those poles when the earth is cleared off. If I can't break through with the dough na formula when I commit it, <laughs> they from the air told me at Sabbath that it will be years before I can clear off the earth, and I guess Grandfather will be dead then, so I shall have to learn all the angles of the planes and the formulas between the year and then the hinger. They from the outside will help, but they cannot take body without human blood. That upstairs it will have the right cast. I can see it a little when I make the vorish sign or blow the powder of Ibn Ghazi at it, and it is near like them at Maeve on the hill. The other face may wear off some. I wonder how I shall look when the earth is cleared and there are no earth beings on it. He that came with the Aklosabaeth said I may be transfigured, there being much of outside to work on. The next morning found me in a cold sweat of terror and a frenzy of wakeful concentration. I had not left the manuscript all a night, but sat at my table under the electric light, turning page after page as fast as I could to decipher the cryptic text. I had nervously telephoned my wife I would not be home, and when she brought me breakfast from the house, I could scarcely dispose of a mouthful. All that day, I read on, now and then halting maddeningly as a reapplication of the complex key became necessary. Lunch and dinner were brought to me, but I ate only the smallest fraction of either. Uh, toward the middle of the next night, I, I drowsed off in my chair, but soon woke out of a tangle of nightmares, almost as hideous as the truths and menaces to a man's existence that I had uncovered. On the morning of September 4th, Professor Rice and Dr. Morgan insisted on seeing me for a while, and both departed trembling and ashen gray. That evening, I went to bed, but slept only fitfully. Wednesday, the next day, I was back at the manuscript and began to take copious notes, both from the current sections and from those I had already deciphered. In small hours of the night, I slept in, a, in an easy chair in my office, but was at the manuscript again before dawn. Sometime before noon, my physician, Dr. Hartwell, called to see me and insisted that I cease work. I refused intimating that it was of the most vital importance for me to complete the reading of the diary and promising an explanation in due course of time. That evening, just as twilight fell, I finally finished my terrible pursuit and sank back exhausted. My wife, bringing my dinner, found me in a half comatose state. I had sufficient strength to get home, but was so clearly in need of medical aid that Dr. Hartwell was summoned at once. As the doctor put me to bed, I could only mutter over and over again, but what in God's name can we do? I slept 
but was partly delirious the next day. I made no explanations to Hartwell, but in my calmer moments spoke of the imperative need of a long conference with Rice and Morgan. My wilder wanderings were very startling indeed to those present. My mania overtook me as I made frantic appeals that something in an aborted-up farmhouse be destroyed, and fantastic references for some plan for the, for the exportation of the entire human race and all animal and vegetable life from the earth by some terrible elder race of beings from another dimension. I would shout that the world was in danger, since the elder things wished to strip it away and drag it away from the solar system and cosmos of matter into some other plane or phase of entity from which it had once fallen vigantillions of aeons ago. I tried to warn those I could in my madness. I called for the dreaded Necronomicon and the Daemon Oleatria of Remigius, in which I seemed hopeful for some finding some formula to check the peril I had uncovered. Finally, my twisting perceptions offered a solution. I remember the motto vividly. Stop them! Stop them! I shouted. Those wildlings were meant to be let in, and, and the worst of all is left. Tell Rice and Morgan we must, we must do something. It's a, it's a blind business, but I know how to make the powder. It hasn't been fed since the 2nd of August when Wilbur came here to his death. And at that rate, the revelation seemingly etched into the fabric of my soul. I apologize. Uh, let me continue on. I suppose I am of a sound physique and slept off my disorder that night without developing any real fever. I woke late Friday, clear of head, though sober with a gnawing fear and tremendous sense of responsibility. Saturday afternoon, I felt able to go over to the library and summon Rice and Morgan for a conference. And the rest of that day, we three men tortured our brains in the wildest speculation and the most desperate debate. Strange and terrible books were drawn voluminously from the stack shelves and from secure places of storage. And diagrams and formula were copied with feverish haste and in bewildering abundance. Of skepticism? There was none. All of us had seen the body of Wilbur Watley as it lay on the floor in a room of that very building. And after that, not one of us could feel even slightly inclined to treat the diary as a madman's raving. I have been requested to limit the documentation of the discussions and research Rice, Morgan, and myself undertook during this time, a request I have gladly acquiesced to. Knowledge such as this is too dangerous for even the most righteous of scholars. So, I shall be brief in my description of our meetings in this record. Opinions were divided as to notifying the Massachusetts State Police, and the negative finally won. There were things involved which simply could not be believed by those who had not seen a sample. Late at night, the conference disbanded without having developed a definite plan. But all day Sunday, I was busy comparing formula and mixing chemicals obtained from the college laboratory. The more I reflected on the hellish diary, the more I was inclined to doubt the efficacy of any material agent in stamping out the entity which Wilbur Watley had left behind him. The earth-threatening entity, which, unknown to us, was to burst forth in a few hours and become the memorable Dunwich Horror. Monday was a repetition of Sunday, for the task in hand required an infinity of research and experiment. Further consultations of the monstrous diary brought about various changes of plan, and I knew that even in the end a large amount of uncertainty must remain. By Tuesday, I had a definite line of action mapped out, and I believed I would try a trip to Dunwich within a, a, a week. Then, on Wednesday, the great shock came. Tucked obscurely away in a corner of the Arkham Advertiser was a facetious little item from the Associated Press telling 
what a record-breaking monster the bootleg whiskey of Dunwich had raised up. Myself, half stunned, could only telephone for Rice and Morgan. Far into the night we discussed, and the next day was a whirlwind of preparation on the part of us all. I knew we would be meddling with terrible powers. Yet I saw that there was no other way to annul the deeper and more malign meddling which others had done before me. Friday morning, Rice, Morgan, and myself set out by motor for Dunwich, arriving at the village about uh, one in the afternoon. The day was pleasant, but even in the brightest sunlight, a kind of quiet dread and portent seemed to hover about the strangely domed hills and the deep, shadowy ravines of the stricken region. From the air of hushed fright at Osborne's store, we knew something hideous had happened and soon learned of the annihilation of the Elmer Fry house and family. Throughout that afternoon, we rode around Dunwich, questioning the natives concerning all that had occurred and seeing for ourselves, with rising pangs of horror, the state the landscape was in. We were informed of a party of state police which had come from Aylesbury that morning in response to the first telephone reports of the Fry tragedy and decided to seek out the officers and compare notes as far as practicable. This, however, we found more easily planned than performed, since no sign of the party could be found in any direction. There had been five of them in the car, and the last information the natives received was that the officers traveled in the direction of the Fry estate. So our party followed suit. Unbeknownst to myself and colleagues, the Dunwich natives who traveled with us were recording our arrival to the ruin. Once more, I am impressed with the local savviness for research and documentation. Here is the record we seized. Well, Armitage, it seems we caught up with the state police. That we have. But Morgan, how is it that five officers departed at dawn, yet their vehicle is still present here at dusk? I don't rightly know. You there. Go search the ruins and find the officers if they're still about. Sir, I... I am not going near that tar pit alone. What if the beast is walking by daylight and... and... I'll go with him. Come on, let's get a move on. Grow a spine, Sam. You're making us look like weaklings to the outsiders. This devastation looks the same as the Watley House, Armitage. Undoubtedly the same thing that Wilbert summoned continued its rampage here. That was never in question, Morgan. I see that scowl, Armitage. What does this tell us? It's only the beginning. What is only the beginning? Uh, while we wait for their return, Earl Sawyer, do please continue telling me the current situation of your region. The, your description during the travel here has been exceptionally helpful. Oh, well, uh, I told you about suspicious cattle on the way here. Yes, yes. The horror has only moved at night so far, and none of us could get a good look at it. Now, I don't believe in a crazed man's words, but... Chauncey thought he could see trees falling and the earth shaking right before him and with nothing there. It was as if some invisible thing was marching along. That makes sense. Well, the, the beast carved a path from the Watley to Cold Spring Glen, from the Glen to the Fries, like you can see over there, and a new trail from the Glen straight to Sentinel Hill. Despite all the commotion each night, the earth shaking, animals running rampant, and the whip of wheels chirping, there's only three paths to and from the Glen. And it hasn't deviated from these paths whatsoever? Seems not. Only diverging from Sentinel Hill's altar stone for sustenance, it seems. It's just as you thought, Rice. Mm. Just as you thought. Now, listen here, you three. I understand you're some big time scholars from Arkham, but this is not some science trick. These are real, God given lives at stake here. I know you city folk look down on Dudwich, but this is my home. And the home of dozens of more souls who have toiled here for generations. That right there is the tar-covered grave of one of my closest friends. Stop treating me like some low left with these whispered thoughts. Give us a goddamn fighting chance! Doctor, doctor, we, Sam, he... Slow down, get some air. Sam. Tell them what you realized at the edge of the glen. God, I told them not to go down into the glen, and I never thought nobody would do it with the tracks, and that smell and the whippoorwills screeching down there in the dark of noonday. 
Are you positive those officers made their way down into the glen? I'm positive, sir. We found their tracks and everything walking the same path the beast did down the hill. We shall not search further then or will likely suffer the same fate. I tried. I tried to warn them. Well, night is soon to fall and it is then that the mountainous blasphemy will lumber upon its eldritch course. Let us depart swiftly now. Negosham, Perambulant, and Tenebris. Rice, Morgan, come here, please. You know the formula, Armitage. Trust in your memory. And you have the alternative formula written down, yes? I have it here. Good. I checked the insect sprayer this morning. It works well enough. If it doesn't, I brought my kid's big game rifle as a last resort. Morgan, a material weapon is going to be of no help. I thought we... Yeah, I know, I know. It at least brings me solace. If all fails tomorrow, I will have one last tool at my disposal, for better or worse. Fine. What is, what is this talk of formulas and sprayers and... You don't plan to face that thing, do you? Earl. I demand to know this instant what the beast is. Earl. We have a right Earl. to- Earl! I have read Wilbur's hideous diary and know painfully well what kind of manifestation to expect. But I will not add to the fright of the Dunwich people by giving any hints or clues. I hope that it might be conquered without any revelation to the world of the monstrous thing that had escaped. These are things, dangerous things, which no one should have knowledge of, things that will bring more death to the world than a farming family and a group of police officers. It is better that these details remain unknown. Do you understand? That, that I do. Good. Then I have a favor to ask of you. I need you to travel to all the homesteads within a 15 mile radius of Sentinel Hill and Cold Spring Glen and assure that their homes are properly boarded up. No one can be out past dark. But it's obvious human loss Earl, revolts. please do this one thing for me. Don't worry, I will. Thank you for coming, Dr. Armitage. Of course. Now you better move quickly. There's only a couple hours of daylight left. And put that recording device down, Earl. Oh, I, I didn't mean to. Don't say anything more. Just put it on the ground and move swiftly out of here. Yes. Goodbye. Have a calmer eye set. Mm-hmm. What's our plan now, then, Armitage? Uh, Morgan, you packed the camping kits in the car this morning, correct? That I did. We may camp here for the night. If the horror comes back this way, we'll be prepared. That clearing there looks like a decent spot. And Morgan, turn that recorder off, please. Oh, yeah. There were rumblings under the hills that night, and the whippoorwills piped threateningly. Once in a while, a wind sweeping up out of Cold Spring Glen would bring a touch of ineffable fodor to the heavy night air. Such a fodor as all three of us watchers had smelled once before. When we stood above a dying thing that had passed for 15 years as a human being. But the look her terror did not appear. Whatever was down there in the glen was biding its time, and I told my colleagues it would be suicidal to try to attack it in the dark. Morning came wanly, and the night sound ceased. It was a gray, bleak day with now and then a drizzle of rain heavier and heavier clouds seemed to be piling themselves up beyond the hills to the northwest. We were undecided on what to do. Seeking shelter from the increasing rainfall beneath one of the few undestroyed fry outbuildings, we debated the wisdom of waiting or of taking the aggressive and going down into the glen in quest of our nameless, monstrous quarry. The downpour waxed in heaviness 
and distant peals of thunder sounded from far horizons. Sheet lightning shimmered, and then a forky bolt flashed near at hand. As if descending into the accursed glen itself, the sky grew very dark, and us watchers hoped that the storm would prove a short, sharp one, followed by clear weather. Dear listener, all this, the collection, these statements and recordings were merely a prologue to this final recording. I am forced to state now if you have not gained direct permission from the president of Miskatonic University and the head librarian of the library of Miskatonic University myself, you are not allowed to hear the contents of this next record. And your journey through this collection has come to an end. If you have gained the proper clearances, then what awaits before you is the clearest, most visceral documentation of the otherworldly on the entire planet. The Dunwich Horror. Merely listening to this event may cause a variety of detrimental conditions such as exhaustion, pain in the head, eyes, stomach, and heart, a delusional perspective, mania, and in extreme cases, a complete loss of self-identity. This is your final warning. With those risks acknowledged, I present to you the Dunwich Horror. Turn on, damn you! Has the rain broken it? It's on! You're gonna be the one that breaks it at this rate! There they are! Dr. Armitage! Dr. Armitage, please wait! Hello, what's... It's out again! God is punishing us! We have to stay together! Oh my god, my god, it's out again, and this time, by day, it's out, it's moving this very minute, and, and only the Lord knows when it'll be on us all. Almost an hour ago, Zeph Watley here heard the phone ringing, and it was Miss Corey, George's wife that lives down by the junction. She says the hired boy Luther was out driving in the cows from the storm after that big bolt, can you see all the trees bending at the mouth of the glen? Opposite side of this, and smell that same awful smell. Just like he smelt when he found the big tracks last Monday morning. And she says, he says there was a swishing, lapping sound. More than the bending trees and bushes could make. And all of a sudden the trees along the road began to get pushed to one side. And there's an awful stomping and splashing in the mud. But... Mind you, Luther didn't see anything at all. Only the bending trees and the underbrush. Then far ahead, where Bishop's Park goes under the road, he heard an awful creaking and straining on the bridge and, and said he couldn't tell the sound of wood started to crack and, and split. And all the while, he never saw a thing, only trees and bushes bending. And, and, and what the swishing sound got very far off on the ropes towards Wizard Watley's and Sentinel Hill, Luther had the guts to step up despite what he'd heard and look at the ground. It was all mud and water and the sky was dark and the rain was wiping out all tracks as fast as could be, but getting at the glen now, the trees had moved. They were still some of the awful prints, big as barrels like he saw Monday. But that isn't the trouble now. Now that was only the start. Zeb here was calling folks up and everybody was listening in when a call from Seth Bishop cut in. His housekeeper Sally was carrying on fit to kill. She'd just seen the trees bent beside the road and said there was a kind of a mushy sound like an elephant puffing 
and treading, heading for the house. Then she up and spoke, sudden of a fearful smell, and said that her boy, Chauncey, was screaming about how it was just like what he smelled up in the Watley ruins Monday morning. And the dogs were barking and whining awful. And then she let out a terrible yell and said the shed down the road had just caved in as if the storm had blown it over. Only the wind wasn't strong enough to do that. Everyone was listening and could hear lots of folks on the wire gasping. All at once, Sally yelled again and said the front yard picket fence had just crumbled up. So there wasn't any sign of what broke it. Then everybody on the line could hear Chauncey and old Seth Bishop yelling too. And Sally was shrieking out that something heavy had struck the house. Not lightning or anything, but something heavy against the front that kept launching itself again and again. So you couldn't see anything out the front window. And then, and then, please, what happened next? And then Sally yelled out, Oh, help! The house is caving in! And on the wire we could hear a terrible crashing and a whole block of screaming. Just like when Elber Fry's place was taken, only worse. That's all. Not a sound or squeak over the phone after that. Right. We heard it and got out the forest and wagons, rounding up as many able-bodied folks as we could get at Corey's place, and came up here to see what you thought best to do. It's not for me to say, but I think it's the Lord's judgment for our iniquity that no mortal can ever set aside. We must follow it. I believe there's a chance of putting it out of business. You know that those Watleys were wizards. This thing is a thing of wizardry and must be put down by the same means. I've seen Wilbur Watley's diary and read some of the strange old books he used to read. No, the right kind of spell to recite to make the thing fade away. Of course, one can't be sure, but we can always take a chance. It's invisible. I knew it would be. There's a powder in this long distance sprayer that might make it show up for a second. Later on, we'll try it. It's a frightful thing to have alive, but it isn't as bad as what Wilbur would have let in if he'd lived longer. You'll never know what the world has escaped. We won't need this one thing to fight and it can't multiply. Yeah, so do a lot of harm. So we mustn't hesitate to rid the community of it. We must follow it. And the way to begin is to go to the place that has just been wrecked. Let somebody lead the way. I, I don't know your roads very well, but I have an idea there might be a shorter cut across lots. How about it? I guess you can get to Seth Bishop's quickest by cutting across the lower meadow here, waiting to work at the low place and Climbing through carriers, no one in Temple Lab beyond. That comes out on the upper road in the sets. A little on the other side. Let's not waste any time then. Mr. Armitage, this way. Let me take up the lead. Of course. Thank you. Here's the tracks to be left. There seems to be the remains. The Seth Bishop estate. That St. Terry sickness is everywhere. I can't stand that hideous smell. It's a fire incident all over again. Not even a house or barn left to stand in. Only a, a tarp that could scarcely resemble a human abode. Pay your respects quickly. The monster's tracks lead that way towards Old Watley's farmhouse at Sentinel Hill. So that's the home where Wizard Watley brought this horror into existence, Armitage? Correct. Through some unholy magic, he and Wilbur raised the thing inside their home. Imagine 
their silhouettes are moving furiously now. I, I think we're close to the end. They are battling with the very cosmos itself up there. Father that he did. 